Good morning, everybody. Uh, Father John Wilson here. It's Monday, April 6th, the Monday of Holy Week. And um, today I'm coming to you from the couch. Uh, we have a, a big, meaty com topic today. Uh, so I figured I would change it up a little bit. Because um, we've been talking about, um, for this Holy Week, the mystery of the cross. Like, why did Jesus have to die? Or probably a better way to put it, is like, why was it in God's wisdom that our Lord would die on the cross? And I said yesterday that there, you know, there are four ways to talk about this. And, you know, this is not an exhaustive list. But, then, you know, but we could say, first of all, he died to pay the price for our sins. He died to reveal to us the true nature of our sin. He died in solidarity for us who, who suffer and die. And he died um, to restore true worship of God. Uh, but before we talk about any of those very specific reasons, we, we, there's another question to tackle, which is, okay, well, well, what is death in the first place? What is this thing that he went through for us? And it's an important question because death is a, a great mystery. It's, in fact, a great uh, paradox. Uh, because on, on the one hand, death is the most natural thing in the world, right? Everybody goes through it. Um, and, you know, if you look at our bodies, uh, they're made of stuff, right? They're made of material. And material decays. That's just just what it does. Um, so, you know, we can see that on the one hand, death is the most natural thing in the world. Um, but there's also an even greater sense in which it's something unnatural, right? It's, um, and this is why we experience grief at the passing of the loved one. It seems wrong in some way, you know, it, and it seems wrong particularly when you compare it to the, the dignity of our spiritual soul. I mean, in those moments of grief, we ask ourselves, well, I, how can it be that the person I have shared this bond of love with, this bond of love that is immaterial, spiritual, how can it be that this person is just going to, I don't know, decay back into the ground? I um, mean, you know, how? that doesn't seem to make sense. You know, we, we have this instinct, and it's a true instinct, that uh, our souls, in fact, are immortal, unlike our bodies. So even, even us as human beings, we're kind of a paradoxical creature. And death really puts a finger on that paradox. What is up with this? What is... How did death enter the world? And to get, get an answer to that, we, we have to look all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to our first parents, the, these folks who we call Adam and Eve. And, you know, in order to talk about them, we, I, I think we got to go, we got to go on a big kind of tangent here. Um, so bear, bear with me. Uh, because, you know, I've, I've noticed, uh, this is something I've learned just in the, in the practice of, of my own preaching, that, I, you know, as I talk about the great mysteries of our redemption through Jesus Christ, uh, I've been drawn back more and more to talk about our first parents, talk about Adam and Eve, talk about, to talk about what it is that Jesus actually had to save us from, um, and I've noticed this in my preaching, and I think it's been a, a surprise for a lot of people because um, a lot of Christians and, you know, a lot of Catholics in particular, I think have gotten into the habit of thinking about the story of Adam and Eve, which we read in uh, the book of Genesis, chapters 2 and 3, as kind of just a nice story. Uh, not something that actually happened. And, and there, there's a reason for that. Um, 
And there, there, there's a couple reasons for that. One, one, and they're, they're understandable reasons, right? There's, you know, one is that we as Catholics, we're not, we're not fundamentalists, right? We don't read every single word of the Bible literalistically. Uh, you know, we recognize that the, the Bible, you know, it is the inspired word of God, but it, it contains different kinds of writing, you know, including, including poetry, Poetry, which uses images and symbols that, you know, when I say you're, you know, in a love poem, like your eyes are, are like diamonds. I don't mean they're literally, you know, bunches of, of hardened carbon, right? Uh, it's an image. And the Bible contains poetry, for instance. Um, that's one reason we tend to sort of kind of just brush aside Adam and Eve. Uh, the other reason is that, you know, I think most Catholic theologians would say this, and, and, and recent popes have said this, that, you know, a belief in God as creator can coexist with a, a, a process that we call evolution. Um, and that's true. But then we have to wait, wait a second, right, because... For a couple of reasons, you know, one is that okay, the Bible is still the Word of God. Uh, the Bible is without error because it is inspired by God. It's without an error in everything that it's it's intending to say. And so, you know, even with Genesis, right? Every every word in that account is trying to tell us something really, really important about ourselves, and even about our history. And it's also true, it's also true that poetry can contain real historical truth. You know, we have epic historical poems, right? Uh, so what, put all this together and if you read all of scripture together, you read all of scripture as telling one story, which the, the, the Catholic Church has been empowered by God to do, um, you come to the realization that there, even in the story of Adam and Eve, there are historical truths that we have to affirm. Um, what, what are they? Well, at the very least, that we we have, at the very beginning of our history, we have those two original parents, and that they were created by God and endowed with a spiritual, immortal soul, and placed in a state of perfect friendship with God. And that then they, like as a historical fact, turned from God through their sin. And this is how death entered uh, the human race. And, you know, I'll, I'll read right, right from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, this is um, paragraph, I had it here. Yeah, paragraph 390. This, this is the way the Catechism of the Catholic Church describes this. It says, The account of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 uses figurative language, you think, okay, garden, serpent, that sort of thing. But affirms a primeval event, a deed that took place at the beginning of the history of man. Revelation gives us the certainty of faith that the whole of human history is marked by the original fault freely committed by our first parents. Right? So there, there is actual history in those chapters surrounded by poetry um, and, and you know, we see this from from saint paul too um you know the when he is actually explaining what it is that jesus christ did for us he said well just as sin entered the world and death entered the world through the disobedience of one man at so too eternal life through the obedience of jesus christ that parallel is really important. And, and, and you might say, okay, well, how, how does this square with um, what, you know, science tells us about, about evolution, 
about kind of the our human prehistory even. And, and you, you, you can, in fact, square it. You know, um, Genesis uses this, this image of, you know, God forming Adam from the dust and into that dust breathing his life-giving spirit. Well, historically, what, what is that dust? Well, it could, it, well, it's, it's the preparation of the material for human life. And, you know, there's no reason God couldn't have done that over the course of millions and millions of years through a series of increasingly complex, complex uh, organisms. Um, he can do that. He can use those tools. He's God. Um, so yeah, it, it, creation does square with this process that we call evolution, as long as we understand it to be, you know, directed by God. And so we actually do have a lot to learn in those first two chapters of Genesis. Um, and a lot to learn about the mystery of death. Uh, one thing we see is that death in our, just in our human nature, right, is, is a, always a possibility. And God tells Adam right away, you know, don't eat the fruit of that tree or else you will die. And, and he, knows what, he knows what God means when God says that. Um, and, and yet death is always a possibility. It's not a necessity, at least in that original state. Um... Because, I mean, God being God, he, you know, he, he can preserve us from death. You know, all, all of us, when we die, we die of something. Um, and so that, that preservation can still come from without. Um, and this, this is, I think we see this represented by the, the tree of life that Adam and Eve are, are meant to eat from. Uh, it's, a, it's that... that that actual sustaining. Um, and so our first parents were created in this beautiful state. They were created not to taste death and in fact created in a perfect harmony with God, with each other, and, and with all of creation. And, and, and we cannot, from in our fallen world, it's hard to even imagine the beauty of that. Uh, book recommendation for you guys uh, to help you imagine this is actually C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. I'll talk more about it later. The Space Trilogy, C.S. Lewis, read it. It's like Narnia for grown-ups, and it'll help you kind of imagine how awesome our first parents were before they fell. But then they fell, right? They turned from God. Uh, they were tempted by the devil, and they disobeyed. And, like, why would they do that? Well, th that original first sin is pride. Um, they were created in this glorious state, and it was easy enough to start to desire even more. That was the devil's temptations, right? Right. You will be like gods. And so he got them to a place where they did not want to receive these good things from God as a gift. They wanted to take them, you know, according to their own plan. This is pride. This is the root of all sin. And when they turned from God in that way, it upset everything. And we see that originally. You know, like right from the beginning in Genesis, you know, even before God came to, to punish them, they were hiding from him. They were blaming each other. Uh, when, when, when we turn our hearts from God, everything collapses. But then God, God finds them out, and he comes with punishment. And the big ticket item is death. So death is a punishment for sin. Now we have to be careful about that. what that means, especially in times like this, right? It does not mean that every one specific death is a punishment for a specific sin, or that if, you know, you suffer death in a way that's especially tragic or untimely, that's because you had sinned in a, you know, a, a really bad way. 
we, we, we can't get into those games. Um, death entered the world because of sin. All of us labor under that burden, but we, we don't make that one-to-one -one correspondence in people's lives. That's not our place. Um, but the other thing about death is that it's, it's a punishment, but it's also a mercy. Uh, because imagine if God hadn't given them that punishment and just had them live forever in that state of alienation from God and from each other. I mean, like that's, that's the very definition of hell. And, you know, we see this in our world, right? You know, we, death is tragic when it happens, but none of us would actually want to live on this earth in perpetuity. There would be something wrong with that. It, it, the eternal life that we hope for has to be something more than that. Um, so the other thing that death does is that it humbles us. It starts to put us back, it's, and it started to put our first parents back in right relationship with God. Um, and, and so that earthly death is actually intended to save us to start the process of our salvation from eternal death, from eternal separation with God, from hell. And, and we actually see that in God's words right from the beginning in a very mysterious way. But um, the church has always read this specific chapter of Genesis in this way. And it it's actually comes from God's curse to the serpent. He curses the serpent, you know, rep representing Satan. And, he's, and he says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your be belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And here's the kicker. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, the offspring of Eve. Uh, that's, the church reads that as like the first hint of Jesus Christ, who is born of woman, and who does crush the head of the serpent. Um, the, the movie The Passion of the Christ shows uh, this really cool, in a really cool way, when Jesus is suffering his agony in the garden, that, um, you know, the devil is tempting him, and out come, like, these, these snakes slithering towards him, and, and you know, in that, that moment where he says, Father, thy will be done, he, like, he takes his foot, and he just stomps on the head of one of those snakes. Um, yeah, our Lord Jesus Christ what he does in suffering on the cross undoes the effect of our first parents' sin. It saves us from sin. It saves us from death. And we'll keep looking at all the ways it does that um, in the next few days. God bless you guys. Wishing you a very prayerful Holy Week. See you soon.